Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. If you're joining us for the first time, it's a real privilege to have you with us. And you've picked a, a lovely opportunity to listen to a special guest, Will Noland. Now, first of all, Will, do you want to say hello to our, our listeners and our viewers? Hello, Tony. Thanks very much for having me on. Now, if you don't know Will, he used to be an English teacher at uh, one of the world's finest so they would say, I'm sure, uh, schools, the Eton College. Uh, Will, tell us a little bit about why uh, you got sacked from Eton. Sure. It's a funny story because I was sacked from the country's most famous all-boys school for a lecture on masculinity. And it was for the flagship debate course of the college. So for the older students who are in their penultimate year, so they're around age 17, and in this course, the idea is that each week they get a lecture, which really stimulates their critical thinking skills. And it's supposed to be quite punchy, hard hitting. So these are difficult topics. They're not expected to agree with it. In fact, they're encouraged to disagree with it. And the theme for the term was identity. So I thought I would give a lecture on what masculine identity has historically depended on and how actually what we now call toxic masculinity things like aggression, competitiveness, stoicism. These have all been valued and not just valued by other men, but valued by women because they help men to protect, to provide for families. So this was regarded as extremely offensive by some other teachers before the lecture was even shown to the students. It was canceled, right? It was canceled. And I was even asked to delete it from the YouTube channel that I had permission for, for from the college, had a disclaimer on saying it wasn't college views. I said, okay, fine, can cancel the lecture, the, uh, the college itself, and I'll even delete it from YouTube as well. If you can just please explain what's wrong with it. Why is this such a bad thing for students which to be able which to debate? Bits? Yeah, which bits? Yeah. Yeah, let me know. I'll, I'll edit them out. And also, I've got a broader worry about the fact that we say we're all about free speech and debate and open discussion. Mm. And yet now I'm being told that because one person's upset, uh, mm. we can't go ahead with any mm. of it. This mm. sounds like cancel culture to me, and it's not mm. what Eton College stands for. And legally, under the Equality Act, curriculum content is exempt. Exempt. So we should be free. Right. Yeah. yeah, we should be free to yeah. discuss any ideas. Yeah. No answers were forthcoming on any of that. So I said, I'm going to leave the lecture up so people can see what I'm under investigation for. Because... And let me just point out, if anybody wants to go to your YouTube channel, uh, just, just look for Will Noland on YouTube. That lecture is there and is available for anybody to watch. Right. That's why I left it up, because now yep. you can see what I was fired for. Yep. And it's yep. called The Patriarchy Paradox. And it's a 30 minute talk with about 45 <laughs> academic references in. Yep. And many people have found it very valuable. Yeah, yeah, and it seems to be fairly objective in its dealing with the concept of of patriarchy and whether it's good or bad or necessary or not necessary. Right, it's provocative because it yep. was yep. aimed at being provocative. That's the whole yep. point of the debate course. Yep. So, just out of interest, where where are you with that whole legal process uh, as we film today? Well, because of COVID, the employment tribunals were fairly backed up. So yeah. my case won't actually be until next year, yeah. probably around this yeah. time next year, October. Yeah. Now, Will, just uh, for your information, for everyone's information, we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. And we're quite unique because the individuals and organisations that come together to form the Coalition for Marriage support this notion of one man, one woman marriage. And that's not for a minute to say that other things don't exist in a liberal democracy. Clearly, they do. But we think that the contribution made by one man and one woman committing to each other in a marriage relationship for life is something unique. It cannot be replica replicated. It cannot be redefined. And the, the benefits it brings to the adults, to children, to civil society in general, uh, far outweigh by a long way, any of the nearer competitors in terms of cohabitation or, or same-sex unions or, or polygamy or anything else, that one thing has been proven time and time again from time immemorial uh, all the way through to all different cultures in the world today to be the thing that makes a real different significant impact on society and developing the best version 
of the next generation. So you, you've got a, a Catholic background, I'm guessing. Yeah, although I wasn't raised even any kind of Christian at all. Just had a more of a do your own thing upbringing. So very liberal in that you let people find their own way. You don't give them any kind of strong guidance on sexual morality. Don't go to church. So pretty much typical modern upbringing. Certainly the same kind of upbringing my parents had from uh, my relatively liberal grandparents um, in the 60s. So I guess I just walked down a few dead ends, really, starting from those assumptions. And then it was really when I married and had kids, I started to think, well, what do I really believe? And I don't want my kids reaching those same conclusions. Those are absurd. Let's go back, figure out where the mistakes were. And then that led to basically Christianity um, as the consequence of a journey of reasoning, really. It wasn't just a, initially a pure faith thing. It was, let's look at the evidence, let's think about it, philosophical arguments, think about the morality, how do we ground these things objectively? And that's how I got where I am. So that's a Romans one type approach, isn't it? Really, there's there's enough evidence around to to so nobody's without excuse. So our supporters um, will come from all faiths and none. I mean, you know, if if I'm honest, the majority will of course be Christian, uh, but there are uh, lots and and within that uh, of all different parts of 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 the the, the broader sense Christian, if you like. Uh, but then um, quite a few who are from different faiths. And then, you know, I have a lot of interaction with people who call themselves atheists and say they, they don't believe anything, but they support this notion of one man, one woman marriage because they, they see and think it has a purpose in society which nothing else can replace. And that's the kind of thing that, that keeps us all together. So that's, um, that's where we come from. Um, can I ask, just out of interest, what, what, are you, what are you up to at the minute? Obviously, you're, you're, you're looking to take your employer to court um, and you know more strength to your elbow on that one uh, but in terms of um, so you, you you're very active on the on, on the blog um, you're and the sub the sub stack and and you're you're uh, releasing every Monday I think it is a new video which is um, you've put quite a lot of pressure on yourself there but well done to you and you've got you know um, thousands of subscribers to that which is brilliant um, what's what's the long is there a longer term plan is there a, a thought ahead of that at the moment i'm really enjoying doing what i love which is the language and literature teaching privately just self-employed i've got no interest at the moment in going back into a school because in my mind eton was so i imagined anyway the pinnacle of british education and having worked there for nearly a decade and seen how the place is changing and the fact that it's the leading institutions that set the tone. I've got no real hope for going into another school and finding things brighter there. So like many academics, um, I'm happy being outside that system for the moment. And the YouTube channel, the Substack writing, this is all really an extension of the literature teaching because this isn't about literature in a narrow sense of just what happens in the last chapter of Christmas Carol, for example. This is about the intellectual, the spiritual tradition of our culture. And literature is just that given expression in written form. So all kinds of ideas fall within that remit. And, and the, what's interesting about your approach, because of your literary background, I mean, literature or successful literature is often the stuff which distills the essence of meaning of the culture. And that's the stuff which is most popular and survives. And I, I like the way you, you pull that stuff out in your discourse. So from antiquity up to the current day, you're very good at distilling the popular literature as it affects the, the topics that you're concerned with. I think that's one of the things that makes literary study so powerful because a classic only really becomes a classic when it touches something about human nature that persists for all time, not just the time the writer writes in. So we're looking really at the things that political ideologies ultimately break against, the things that are fixed in human beings. And time and time again, we see this clash between 
ideologies that think they can do away with marriage, do away with the family and introduce this bright, shining future. But it doesn't work. No. And, and it's funny because that, that takes us into some of the things we're going to discuss. But um, Thomas Sowell's notion of, of constrained versus unconstrained visions. And, and it, we seem to be in a situation at the moment where you've got a group of people who think, well, the past may well have something valuable to contribute. So let's not chuck it all away at once. Let's incrementally build on it. Uh, versus another group of people who Saul, uh, Saul calls the unconstrained visionaries, who say actually it's of no relevance and we want to create a brand new future based on what we want now. Uh, and if you think the past is of any relevance at all, you're part of the problem. Uh, that, that seems, although that was written quite a time ago, that book, it's been updated since, seems to me to be quite a good explanation of the, the two uh, conflicting visions that are dominating society. Yeah, I think fundamentally that's it. And at the core of the unconstrained, or as some would say, liberal vision, is ultimately autonomy. And this is the idea that people should be completely free to author their own lives, find their own meaning. And any kind of imposition from the outside is regarded as oppressive. Now, this might have manifested, first of all, for example, in rebellion against the church. So who are you to tell me what's the right way to behave sexually? If I want to have sex outside marriage, then that's my choice. And then we can also see this in, for example, transgenderism. I want to be free to decide that although I was born a man, I am actually a woman. That is how I author myself. This is me finding my meaning. But the problem is that the conservative vision actually regards all those ways of creating meaning by just clicking our fingers as ultimately meaningless. It's the grounding in something outside ourselves. It's exactly the imposition from the outside that gives true meaning. If you try to play tennis, for example, and there's no net, there's no game, or if you were dancing and there are no steps to follow, then there's no real dance at all. And it's the same thing with freedom and moral stricture. Mm. I think it's, it's funny because th there are uh, part of some of the explanation uh, of all this is, is the idea that young people, sp I mean, a couple of things. First of all, the whole situation with family breakdown and, and normality as, as was once recognized, but also the fact that so many people spend so much time online that they then take that psychology of you can be whatever you want and create what avatar you want into their real lives, if you like. And, and the online becomes the prevailing um, psychology and, and is then mirrored in real life, if you like, and it, it doesn't work. Because what, what we've seen uh, and what seems to have been manifested physically is this idea that so growing up with your with your married mum and dad your committed mum and dad seems to have produced physically the best version of the next generation uh, and it almost seems well if i can imagine something completely different to that uh, then i'll let my imagination trump the experience of thousands of years right there's a arrogance there's a hubris in that and it's the attempt to move away from the fact that we are embodied beings we're not just free floating intellects that can create things on a whim. So human beings have a nature and this means specific things are good for us. And we're radically dependent on each other. And the family is the first place where we realize that and have those needs met. But the idea that the family is an oppressive construct that people need to become free from that's been a very powerful idea in modern culture for probably around 150 years or so now. Because you wrote an interesting blog post, Why Marriage Will Endure. And it reminds me of a conversation I had recently with uh, Professor Brad Wilcox in the US. I don't know if you know him, uh, a wonderful researcher on marriage and family and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but, um, you know, he was saying, carry on because the force is with you you can't lose. And I thought, huh, that's quite interesting. You know, his point was that every aspect of human nature, 
of human development supports the idea of um, the concept of family, the concept of civil society being built from the ground up, the concept of, of as Katie Faust would talk about, you know, a, a child's uh, innate need for its biological parents, the, the biological parents need to look after and to nurture their children. And, you know, that is, is not going anywhere anytime soon, irrespective of what might come out of academia or be taught to people in, in you know, cloistered kind of um, theoretical concepts, if you like. Right. And that's because it's an expression of human nature. Marriage is a human universal. There was no stage at which promiscuity was a general phase of human history. If children don't know who their fathers are, it's chaos. So to say we're going to do without marriage is flying in the face of the entirety of human history. And if you look at for example, the Russian Revolution, when Alexandra Kolontai got very excited about the idea that the home fire, as she put it, would be extinguished and divorce was made very easy. Alimony laws were abolished. What were the consequences of that? Women and children prostituting themselves in the streets for bread and the men who drafted in Kolontai's reforms ended up being shot because it was such a disaster. Even when parents are given the choice to become liberated, as the revolutionaries put it, from family, they end up choosing family in the end anyway. I mean, if you look historically, there seems to be, uh, uh, I suppose, w when you analyze why we are where we are as a culture, th there are I s various possibilities. So you've got, you've got the example of, um, good laws being used um, inappropriately and then progressing. So, for example, the original divorce laws were laws of mercy to free uh, mainly women who were trapped in abusive relationships and had no way out. And it just was, it needed to be dealt with, you know, finding them a way out from a, an abusive man. Uh, but then those laws get misapplied and then get extended. That's one example. You've, you've got the other argument of, well, um, a liberal democracy generally um, tends towards um, being more and more liberal for smaller and smaller groups. And what you end up is that for that tiny group to live its truth, the bigger group has to believe things that are objectionable to its eyes and its ears. And then you've got the argument of, well, is there a bad actor kind of argument? So in the background, you, and what you said kind of made me think of this. You've got the Communist Manifesto uh, way back, which wanted to abolish family. You had the, the Gay Liberation Front Manifesto, 73, 78, which again wanted to abolish the family. The BLM Manifesto more recently, abolish the family. What's this thing about abolish the family? Why is it there? And, um, uh, you know, what's the genesis of it? Well, I think... One reason stems from this obsession with autonomy as the core of liberalism and the fact that the family is actually our first experience of authority. So the parents and the father in particular represent authority. It's the first time it's encountered for the child. So the idea that this is the face of oppression that we need to smash and rebel against, that's a powerful reason. Another reason I think is more political if we can weaken the family then because human beings are insufficient individually because we're dependent then you will strengthen dependence on the welfare state and this means big government it means control it means the state making inroads into the private sphere that should be the remit of the family but that's attractive to people of a certain political persuasion but I think both of those reasons are ultimately insufficient. And if we apply Cardinal Manning's dictum that all human conflict is ultimately theological, then the attack on the family finds its deepest explanation ultimately as a spiritual phenomenon, because it's no coincidence that what we have is a broader attack on patriarchy, male authority, and the father in the family 
is a reflection of the heavenly father, capital father, God. So Marx was explicit about this. He said that the holy family can only be destroyed when the earthly family is. So ultimately, I think the attack on marriage and on family is at its deepest root, satanic. So you would add another aspect that it's not just a legal decline. It's not just a, a d d decline in um, liberalism. It's not just uh, evil actors, but you would add a spiritual dimension to that as well. Yeah, I think that's right. And Marx yeah. himself makes that point yeah. clear in yeah. saying there's a connection between the holy family and the earthly family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea of actually uh, chaos instead of order. Um, this whole thing of burn it all down. Who cares what comes next? Just burn it all down. Really. Right. It's a form of hatred and spite. Marx, yeah. again, everything yeah. that exists deserves to burn. Yeah. And yeah. because the masculine is the principle of order, then if we want to create disorder, if we want to introduce chaos, then we have to assault that principle first. Um, so let me ask you uh, a question which I know you have a view on. Can a man become a woman? Well, no, ultimately. And this is because if we think about what the essence of a man is, what the essence of a woman is, in all species, we've got binary sex. Sex isn't to do with chromosomes. It even exists in some species with no chromosomes at all. So being a man is about having small gametes. Being a woman is about having large gametes. So what, what, is that, what is that for our, I mean, do you know what that means? I, I'm, I'm happy to admit, I don't. Yeah. So perhaps you could inform me and our, our listeners what that means. Sure. So it's about the reproductive potential. So being a man means having the potential for fatherhood, ultimately. Small gametes or sperm. Being a woman means having the potential for motherhood. Large gametes, ovaries. And this applies throughout nature. So the reason that a trans woman is not a woman is ultimately because there's no potential for pregnancy. Now, does this mean that a uh, infertile woman, for example, isn't a woman? No, it just means that the potential was there, but through some kind of genetic defect or maybe an accident of some sort, the potential wasn't allowed to actually actualize. So it's linked to motherhood and fatherhood, ultimately. Trans women can't become pregnant. There's no potential to. What about our Gender Recognition Act, which uh, goes all the way back to 2004, that actually says uh, if a currently, of course, they want to change it and make it much easier in Scotland. But currently, uh, if a man, for example, has lived as a woman, as decided by a couple of doctors um, uh, for a couple of years, then they can have uh, their uh, a gender a document identifying that their gender has formally changed. Not only that, but their birth certificate can be amended to say that they were born in the opposite sex. So history can be rewritten. Um, how do you feel about that? You can make a law saying that, but it doesn't make it true. We could all have a vote tomorrow and vote to say that triangles have got four sides or that the chemical composition of gold is different. It doesn't change the objective reality of it. And if we take that line of reasoning to its conclusion, what happens if I get two doctors to say that I was born a cat and I've lived as a cat for X amount of years, therefore I am one. And people who don't say that I am or that who upset me with tweets saying I'm not should go to jail. It's the same kind of principles are involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we get you a litter tray to start off with. And, and in fact, there are examples of children in the U.S., who have litter trays in school because they identify as cats. Right, and there we go. I get people saying to me, um, you know, Tony, why do you bother? With... So other organisations, other pro-marriage organisations will talk about and talk the benefits of marriage, which I, which I spend my life doing uh, for society, but they won't mention the fact that actually marriage is just between a man and a woman. And Tony, why do you bother with that? Why bother picking that up when there's only such a small number of people involved? And I'd like to take, you know, see what you think about that, because my approach is, well, there's two reasons. Firstly, if you take the, the concept of um, love is love, as a as a proposition and so anybody who loves each other can get married well that doesn't stop anymore at two men or two women it goes way beyond that to um, 
the concept of man and woman doesn't exist anymore because actually it's just about love. So it, it removes gender from the conversation completely and it goes down all sorts of roads, not only the trans stuff that we've seen, but animals, uh, a father marrying his daughter as long as they, you know, they both consent and they agree not to have children or whatever. Love is love, hey? And even we're getting arguments these days from paedophiles saying, hey, 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 I'm born this way. You can't criticize me. That's just the way I am. So, you know, don't don't be nasty to me. I'm a minor attracted person. And and then it goes even way beyond that, which maybe we don't want to get into. Um, so that's that's one argument is to say, well, yeah, fair enough. But if you let the principle of it doesn't matter whether it's a man and a woman go, well, you've you've lost the whole thing. Um, but secondly, even though the numbers are small, the principle affects everyone. You know, so we've seen what's happened with smoking laws and we've seen what's happened with seatbelt, you know, laws. It changes society. And once we promulgate this this concept that love is love and that's the only thing that marriage that matters to marriage. Well, people listen to that and they think, well, if that's it, what's the point? And also, if I do get married and I don't feel in love, well, I'll just forget my marriage um, because... I don't love anymore, so I'll just change my partner like I might change my supermarket choice or my phone provider or whatever else. That's exactly it. So love is love is a very dangerous premise and you can reduce it to absurdity very quickly as you did in that good explanation there because it's the exact thing that paedophiles, for example, will appeal to for intergenerational love. If there's consent and there's love, well, then why not? And trying to redefine marriage in any of the ways you outlined there is ultimately an attack on marriage as an institution and therefore an attack on the stability of society more broadly because the family founded on marriage is the fundamental social cell or social unit. So if children are hearing these ideas that they're all new forms of family now, different kinds of marriages, then what are they going to think of the original one? That it's somehow not valuable anymore? It's no better than the others, even though all the data points towards the fact that children do best in a home with both biological parents. So going back to basics then, why is it that even the most primitive tribes were monogamous? Why is it that pair bonding is as old as the human species? Why is it that marriage is a human universal? Why hasn't promiscuity ever been a stage in human history? Well, it's because marriage is ultimately for not just the generation of children, so procreation, but also rearing them, educating them. So this is why we have the lifelong bond between man and woman in other words marriage because it takes like 18 years to rear a child yeah and that minimum. requires commitment and you know right. katie faust is very good on this that actually you you need a man and a woman because generally speaking men and women bring different things to the table and the child needs both right this is the christian idea of one flesh in the marriage the mother is like the heart of the home the father mm. is the head mm. and whereas the mother might bring qualities like tenderness nurturing compassion yeah. Yeah. especially in the younger years yeah. the father is particularly important for qualities about discipline and obedience for example mm. and again mm. the modern data on this is clear that boys teenage boys in particular without a biological father at home mm. suffer from a lack of boundaries mm. in particular so yeah, the and there's, there's um, yeah. uh, who is it? Warren Farrell's um, the is it the boy crisis? That's it. Yeah, uh, that, and he deals with the research around that very, very well. Really, that you know, we are we are facing a fatherless epidemic, uh, and the thing that keeps fathers at home statistically is marriage, and so that's the thing. That's why marriage is so important. It keeps dads hanging around. Uh, and there's lots of danger associated with, you know, sequential partners for, for women, danger towards the kids as well as the women. But another thing which I wonder, you comment on, see what you think. Um, 
the idea that dads, you're quite right, the effect of dads, and I don't think Will uh, uh, Warren brings this out or he might do, but that dads help their kids cope with disappointment and suffering. And we seem to have a generation of kids who just are so thin-skinned because they, they simply cannot cope with anything not going their way or them not getting their way. And again, that may well be down to the fatherless crisis, which may well be down to the, the marriage crisis, if you like. Yeah, there are good reasons for why women are generally more risk averse than men are. It's because biologically, the woman is more precious. The, the death of a mother will most of the time lead to the death of the child. So we don't want women rushing into physical fights, for example, or go back far enough. We don't want women doing the dangerous hunting. We want to try and keep them safe. So they will tend to avoid risky situations for themselves and their children for really good evolutionary reasons. But this can be bad when the child isn't exposed to good kinds of risk to help them grow, to help them become, as the phrase people might have heard, anti-fragile. So, okay, yeah, I can do this. Um, I might have fallen over a bit on my bike, but I'm still here and I can keep going. I can learn from the experience. Now, dads tend to be more willing to take risks and to help children grow in that way. Maybe it's going to be more adventurous activities. Maybe it's going to be camping, hiking, sports, things that involve the possibility of failure. If kids don't get that, then they don't develop the kind of emotional toughness or calluses, if you like, to be able to deal with the bad things life brings their way. Yeah, yeah. And let's let's be clear, of course, you know, sometimes you will find uh, 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 a woman who is more aggressive than a man. And you may even have a relationship with that. But we're, we're looking at things on a population uh, basis. And, and this comes back to the constrained versus unconstrained uh, Thomas Sowell stuff. And whether, in fact, you know, there are some people who think all of that is just social construct. But I, I think uh, Louise Perry point, and we might want to talk about Louise Perry, because I, I noticed she mentions you in her book, doesn't she? The, the uh, Case Against Sexual Revolution. Um, but... Um, she makes the point that, well, if you're sat in an office, a man and a woman on a laptop or working from home and meeting on Zoom meetings, actually, there isn't always that much of a difference between a man and a woman in that kind of environment. But you get yourself down the gym for even half an hour and you will see that there is just a fundamental divide between men and women. You know, I was in the gym this morning and, you know, I'm, I'm nothing special in the gym, right? But there's very rarely come across a woman that can move anywhere near the sort of weight you're moving, you know, because that's just a fundamental difference. And again, across across a population base, that's not just a physical thing. It has other manifestations in terms of traits and um, preferences. And even, you know, we know the story, even in the most egalitarian of societies where they've tried to equalize these things out in terms of opportunity, you still get more women wanting to be nurses and more men wanting to be engineers. And it's not a close thing. It's it's completely separate, you know, because of, because of those factors. Yeah, and that's what the patriarchy paradox was about as its starting point, because it's not just even in those societies, it's especially in those societies. That's the paradox. The more equal a society becomes, the more the sexes diverge. So give people choice and you start to see the differences even more clearly. And yes, it's true on the surface level, looking at people working in pods in an office, you might not see much difference, but even then in that environment, psychologically, there are still big differences in things like trait disagreeableness. So those qualities that we see more often in men of being disagreeable, being more stubborn, they're actually important for imposing rules, order, discipline on a household. So it's regarding discipline and boundaries, remember, that single mothers provide the worst kind of environment for teenage boys growing up. Now, there's a very offensive thing to say for many people, but the data is clear that the single mother household for a teenage boy in particular struggles the most with discipline. Yeah, well, it's funny you should, I mean, I had a, I grew up with a single parent, a single mother background. Um, and it, I suppose I'm slightly different to others. I was, 
I was, how can I put this? I, I, pick, I don't see very well, right? Well, I'm, I'm registered blind, so I've got no idea what you look like, okay, which is quite interesting. But because of that, and also my mum, uh, she, was, she was alcoholic. So, um, in fact, they, nobody knew I was registered blind until I went to school. And they thought, what's wrong with this guy? Why can't he? Oh, right, that's interesting. Now, I, I had developed a kind of toughness because of that, I think. Without, do you know what I mean? Which, is, mm. which almost kind of saved me from the, the, the typical way that somebody in that situation may well have turned out, if you like, which is, which is really interesting. But you're absolutely right. We've, we've got to find a way in society of saying, look, um, at no point should we allow a child to grow up um, in a single parent background in poverty because nobody wants that. It's the worst possible. And I know because every penny in our house went on special brew. That isn't good, right? But equally, we can't say as a society that it's, it's a valid choice to grow up and to intentionally be a single parent. You know, I'm not sure that... You can do that because it's a free country, right? But just like we don't want to promote um, obesity, you're, you're free to go and do whatever you want. It's a free country. But actually, let's not promote it as a, the best way of living because clearly there are some ways are better than others. Yeah, and I would even dispute the, the free country idea, really, because <laughs> well, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, yeah. there's also an argument that it's a, a form of slavery and dependency. So free love as a slogan sounded great. It was a honey trap and people fell for it because what we've actually seen is that there's no liberation from the, the terrible, oppressive patriarchy and the father figure. Instead, all you've got is now a genuinely bad form of patriarchy, which is the ever encroaching welfare state. So the single mothers have gone from the family environment with the father as provider to the state supplanting that as provider instead. And that's lacking the kind of benevolence and personal touch that you get from the actual father. You're right. And I think th the thing is, and, and we don't, you know, I know how hard it is for single mums from personal experience, but what we don't want um, is for the state to... Uh, which is often the case these days, is to penalise you financially from uh, living with the father of your children. So you'll lose benefits. Now, that, that really doesn't make any sense at all because it's incentivising, you know, something which is less than optimal for the children. Thinkers like George Gilder, for example, and Jeff Dench pointed this out in books that were largely ignored by academia 20 years ago or so. It's a very cunning way to undermine the family and male authority if you can incentivize single motherhood financially. So your thesis is actually uh, a lot of this uh, is, is purpose driven in order to uh, break up families because families are self-secured, families pass on customs from one generation to the other, families are uh, you know, dependent on themselves, they don't need big government. And in order then to create government dependency in order then to create a power structure you need to abolish the families um and would, would that be kind of where you're coming from yeah that's in so many words the way in which the basic socialist attack on the family proceeded um marx and owen and Fourier and some of the other early 19th century socialist thinkers were quite clear about this and that's why we get again and again this fantasy of promiscuity at some stage in the distant past and some of these thinkers and as we see the ideas taking flesh in the form of some of their experimental communes the idea is that it's all about free flowing eroticism and there's no enforcement of sexual morality and it's not a coincidence the breakdown of family and sexual liberation always go hand in hand. That's what the sexual revolution was about, right? And not just in the 60s, but in the Russian revolution too. We see these things going together. So I think the motivation is largely about trying to get sexual pleasure without responsibility as well. And for men too, that's one of the factors underlying feminism. It's the male escape from responsibility for a family, but wanting the pleasure of sex anyway. 
And we've, we've so a couple of things there. We, we did a video a while ago on uh, the, the work of J.D. Unwin, 1930s social anthropologist in Oxford. Uh, and he's, he was looking at very briefly uh, how society, he, he analyzed a whole load of cultures across time and, and analyzed how some thrived and what led to their demise, if you like, you know, from the Roman Empire, everything else like that. And he said that those cultures that uh, followed um, the idea of chastity before marriage, monogamy, and the third thing was the worship of a deity, they tended to thrive. But as soon as they as soon as they let go of the concept of chastity, sex reserved for heterosexual marriage, that's when they began to, to demise. Um, and they had about 100 years from that point. And looking at Unwin's map, depending on who you talk to, you know, we've maybe got 30 years left before we're either taken over by another cu culture, we destroy ourselves internally through civil war or, or something else happens. That, that's an interesting one. And then the other point you made, which I thought was very, very good, uh, again, you look at uh, from Soviet Russia, the, the way in which you destroy families is threefold. You trivialize sex, you confuse gender roles, there's no difference between man and woman, and you get rid of long-term relationships. No fault, divorce, just don't bother getting married. And you think, well, those things are pretty familiar and pretty dominant in the culture. So what hope is there for us, Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. One, Currently, there don't seem to be many signs of things slowing down. Looking at the real centers of power, whether it's going to be in media or education, the ideas still, as my firing shows, are very much against this idea that patriarchy and that the traditional institution of the family has much going for it. It's still seen as somehow totally at odds with any sense of the dignity of women and the individual autonomy of people. But what happens if they keep going with this line of attack? Well, the results, and let's come back to the idea of the ghetto as the canary in the coal mine again, that's the exemplary crisis of our times, as George Gilder put it. The results are going to be disastrous. So we can see this as basically full speed ahead to crazy town, and eventually the train will come off the tracks. And then people will realize that there's been a big mistake. Mm. And that's ultimately what happened in the Russian Revolution with Alexandra Kolontai's ideas, the women and the children in the streets prostituting themselves, people saying, we've got to rebuild the family. And in fact, Gorbachev, for example, was really keen on trying to strengthen the family even right towards the end of the Soviet Union. It took a long time for them to recover all that damage, but they knew the damage had been done we might end up in that situation. Nothing can bring it back except total collapse. Or we're looking at basically parents themselves figuring out that this is bad before we get to that point and trying to do what they can to use the family in its traditional role as a conduit for education, the transmission of tradition. And that's one of the reasons why the socialist revolutionaries have always sought to attack the family because it is where education happens and they might not like what the parents are teaching the children so we want to get hold of the youth as early as possible to mold them to take their minds before they're fully formed and indoctrinate them so i think that the signs of homeschooling being on the rise not just in the us but the uk as well are promising and this shows parents taking their role as the child's primary educators more seriously. So this gives us some reason for hope. And then ultimately, the biggest reason for hope is that we know that any of these fantasies not founded on human nature ultimately break in the end, even if it takes decades. That's right. Back to Brad Wilcox's point, you know, the force is with you. There, there is something which has worked for millennia. It's not going to stop working and people are going to tend back towards that, you know. Uh, we've got this, we live in this interesting, you know, social media bubble, the kind of uh, internet bubble, which society has just never, ever experienced before, you know. Again, if you look at it from a, a traits perspective, you've got the, the more open type who are, are keen to explore different ways of living and life, and they're generally more activist, whereas the traditionalists are generally more quiet. And so 
uh, you know, on a population basis, social media lends itself to the benefit of the activists because their voices are heard more than those who are who generally tend to quietness. But um, I think, you know, it, I I think it will equalise itself just because of the, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the fact that these things are kind of innate within us. And saying that, Will, just saying those things is not homophobic because we recognise that other relationship types, of course, they exist in a liberal democracy. And it's up to that liberal democracy to decide what rights and responsibilities are given. To, you know, obviously those things are there. Um, but you had uh, uh, an interesting, another uh, blog post you wrote. You write that um, disgust with homosexuality is not homophobic. Um, explain that a little bit for me. Yeah, this is a interesting concept in the scientific literature, which is that disgust and fear are distinct psychological reactions, and they even involve different parts of the brain. So looking at how straight men, for example, react to a picture of gay men kissing, this isn't to do with fear the empirical evidence shows it's to do with disgust and calling it homophobia as if it's an irrational fear doesn't account for that. So there was one experiment where they showed that the reaction to looking at maggots, for example, actually involved the same area of the brain as looking at pictures of men kissing did. Now there's nothing irrational about this. The argument is that the disgust is a natural reaction because it's to do with the fear of contamination. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, in the deepest sense, homosexuality is an assault on the social and sexual mores of a culture. Now, why are those there? Because they safeguard something important. And if you look at the actual data on the likelihood of STDs, early death, etc. Even the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association is very clear in what gay men should talk to their doctors about, that they're at massively increased risk for many kinds of diseases, and also that their life expectancy is much lower than that of straight men. And this, and let's let's be clear on that, because actually if you've just got a gay couple who are monogamous, that might not be the case. But the tendency is, for men at any rate, uh, um, relationships, according to the data, are not monogamous. Um, that isn't the point of the relationship. That's why it's love is love. It's not about monogamous sex. It's about, um, you know, random sex with strangers and having various sleepaways agreed per month and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's certainly an important point to remember, although even within the very rare monogamous homosexual relationships there are still all kinds of extra biological considerations yeah, yeah. to do with the just physiology of the anatomy that, that means it's not right. as healthy yeah. very delicately put but you're absolutely right so, yeah yeah fair enough. yeah so there are there are good reasons in other words why we might have this disgusted reaction so homophobia is an easy way to try and smuggle in through the terminology that it's purely irrational that's literally what the phobia aspect means and it's just hate but the science doesn't support that so the point of that blog post was just to introduce this idea for discussion because most teenage boys at school having their um, sex education classes will be um, met with this immediate shutdown that, no, it's homophobic. Um, if you're not fully supportive of uh, gay marriage, for example, and even though that threatens your sense of identity as a male and what the institution of marriage is about and the dignity of procreation and rearing children within the context of the heterosexual family, even though it threatens all of that, it's just a phobia. You're just irrationally afraid. But the evidence just does not support that viewpoint. So um, in terms of where we go from here, I think we've, we've covered one or two um, uh, you know, propositions. We either implode um, or, or parents 
you know, realise, well, good grief, we need to do something about this and we need to, to focus on families a bit more. Um, what about the, the other things that um, we would, we've come across? So uh, MPs and, and policymakers that I speak to um, do say they encourage people to write to them because often, like I mentioned, you know, they'll only hear one side of the debate and it's very difficult for them in that case to, um, to, to act uh, against it. And, and even they're fearful. Well, I often mention the, the, the Comres um, anonymous survey of October 2018 among MPs where over half of those who responded said they were too fearful to speak their mind on some of these issues. This is our lawmakers, right, who are too afraid to say what they think and presumably therefore too afraid to vote with how they think on some of these issues. That puts us in a very difficult position. And again, I would say, uh, just like we can't, we don't want society imposed from the government down, in order to change society, we can't wait for that to happen from the government down. As I think you indicated, we need to encourage that to happen from the ground up. You know, that's how civil society is built from the ground up. And the most basic building block, of course, is the family unit. So we need to find a way of encouraging people to get married, to stay married, to have lots of children. Um, any comments on that? I think it is true that ultimately in their daily lives all parents can really do is commit with renewed seriousness to the dignity of marriage and do the best they can for their children but if you look at what has happened historically with the fall of rome for example there's that saying that a fish rots from the head down and childlessness in the roman ruling class preceded the falling of fertility population wide so there is this sense in which change starts at the top and this is why revolutionaries will tend to want to capture the leading institutions so that they can bring in what they want to see among the elite first and then the populace follows so right we can't wait for the change to come from the top but eventually i think some kind of counter revolution will have to come from the top so we will need it done in the elite class as well yeah. just because the laws need changing right because culture <laughs> in a very real sense yeah. is downstream from law yeah yeah so yeah. if you start to change laws then you affect cultural behavior yeah 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 yeah, yeah. very good well well um it, it's a privilege to talk to you um it's it's strange that you are, are a controversial character because what you're saying uh, would not have been seen contra as controversial even 10 years ago, but just, well, isn't that obvious stuff? Uh, and again, it's not about, I like the way you highlight that this isn't about hatred um, of, of any individuals, let alone a group of individuals or fear. Um, I, I I'm getting the feeling I'm a bit more of a classical liberal. Uh, you know, I do think let's the only way to get through is to let people live the lives they want as long as they don't interfere with other people. And it seems to be that interfering with other people, which is which we're struggling with at the minute, because, well, actually, you've now got to. So it's like cauliflower. Um, I can't stand cauliflower. Well, really don't like it. Um, <laughs> I really you know, it's, it's absolutely putrid. But, you know, I'm married to somebody who really likes it that's okay. <laughs> it turns out that's okay. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't like the taste of cauliflower. And we need to find a way of just being able to exist together as a society, recognising that people feel very differently about very different things, whether it be economic expenditure and taxing fuel companies or, or whether it be these details. But that doesn't necessitate hate and fear. We need to be able to work through these things and to be able to live together. I would say, leave the kids out of it. That would be a, you know, a denominator for me. Leave the kids out of it because we, we do seem to be teaching too much to the kids. And, you know, we, we had uh, um, an industrial e economist, um, Professor Payton, on the channel recently talking about the more, from an evidence base, the more we teach kids about sex, the more sex kids seem to have. And it just seems to be a linear thing. 
and our response is, well, we better teach more in that case. Ha, ah, no, because then they just have more different types of sex, even earlier than before. Why don't we try the other thing, which is actually to teach them about sexual restraints um, and see how that goes for a generation or so, you know? Um, but there we are. Listen, um, it's such a privilege to talk to you. I could spend the day talking to you because you're a fascinating fellow. I, I love your linguistic background and, and your, your literary uh, allusions and everything else, which, is, which just permeates all of your work. When you've um, sorted out this business with Eton and when you've sued them and you've won, will you come back and talk to us again? I'd love to, yeah. It's been great to speak great. to you. All right. Well, uh, Will Noland, real privilege. I recommend everyone go and read your Substack uh, and watch your videos on YouTube. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Tony.